Hi and welcome to this short video on the commonly missed topics in Unit 2. So remember as we're looking at these units and we're reviewing for the AP test, these are the units based on the AP curriculum and not based on our curriculum from the school year. So as I was looking at the progress checks that you guys completed, topics 2.1 and 2.6 were the two uh, most missed where the average was just one out of three questions on the progress check. So we're going to focus on those two topics. Obviously all of the other topics are important so make sure that you do review uh, the unit guides so you're still looking over everything else in unit two but these are just the two most missed. So topic 2.1 looked at types of chemical bonds. So before we talk about determining the type of bond I just want to look up here um, in the right hand corner so atoms or ions bond due to the interactions between them. So remember and make sure that you can distinguish between the two atoms will form molecules, ions will form ionic bonds. And so make sure that you're using the correct terminology when you're talking about molecules or ionic substances. And so those are always based on the interactions between them, whether it is a covalent bond or an ionic bond. Um, but something else to remember is that compounds, so when you are forming something new, chemical reaction is when you take two reactants or, or more and you form a product, right? Or maybe you take one reactant and form two products. But the whole idea is that you're taking reactants and that you're forming something new. And that something new that you form has different properties than what you started with. So that's something to keep in mind as well. When you form something new, that product is going to have different properties from the reactant. And so when we look at types of bonds, um, we can look at how we determine the type of bond. So when we're looking at um, the atoms or we're looking at you know, the, the different elements that are making up the bond, electronegativity differences will help us determine the type of bond that exists. And that's specifically when we're looking at nonmetals. I'll talk a little bit more about when metals come into the picture, but electronegativity differences will help us determine the type of bond that exists. So remember that electronegativity, that trend increases up and to the right. Fluorine is the most electronegative atom. And so you have fluorine, oxygen, chlorine, those are your three most electronegative atoms on the periodic table. Um, and so a small electronegativity difference, so if you're comparing um, two nonmetals like carbon and hydrogen, that has a very small electronegativity difference. Or you have um, two substances that are the same, like iodine and iodine. So you have a, a bond between two iodine atoms. A small electronegativity difference, or no difference, a difference of zero, uh, means that the electrons are shared evenly. And so when you have a small electronegativity difference, your electrons are shared fairly evenly. When you have a large electronegativity difference between two nonmetals, the electrons are not shared evenly. So you have an uneven sharing of electrons that results in a dipole. So you have a partial positive and a partial negative side. Notice how those two were looking at nonmetals and I talked about electrons being shared. That's because when you have two or more nonmetals, those are covalent bonds. And so that means that electrons are shared, not necessarily evenly, but they're still shared. When you have a metal and a nonmetal, the electrons are transferred so the electrons are transferred from the metal to the nonmetal. That's what gives us cations with metals and anions with nonmetals. So notice the difference here. We have three different types of bonds that we were looking at. One where electrons are shared evenly, one where electrons are shared unevenly, um, and the one when electrons are transferred, and we'll look at those bonds in a second. So what's another way that we can determine the type of bonding experimentally? So this is where we're thinking about the properties. Now, this is covered much more in unit three, uh, more specifically topic 3.2, but remember that ionic substances have very high melting points, high boiling points, um, and it conducts electricity as a liquid or as an aqueous solution, but not as a solid. So if you're trying to figure out if something is ionic, um, it will conduct electricity as either a liquid or an aqueous solution, but if you check conductivity as a solid, it will not conduct. And then uh, covalent substances, so these usually have relatively low boiling points and they don't conduct electricity. Obviously, there are those few covalent network solids that are different, um, but in general, 
And then metallic solids, uh, they conduct electricity as a solid. So that's why you have copper wire, things like that. So if we continue looking at these types of bonds, so here's where we're looking at these different types. Nonpolar covalent. So notice how I have covalent and covalent. Remember that's nonmetals. Nonpolar covalent is between two nonmetals where the electrons are shared evenly. You have even sharing of electrons. That's a nonpolar covalent bond. And you have similar electronegativity values, a difference either close to zero or zero, like carbon and hydrogen, or chlorine and chlorine. Then you have polar covalent bonds. Polar covalent bonds are between two nonmetals because again, covalent. And remember that covalent, whether it's nonpolar or polar, the electrons are still shared. Polar covalent bonds are between two nonmetals where the electrons are not shared evenly. That means that you have one side of the bond um, that's attracting the electrons more than the other. And that's when you have uh, a larger difference in electronegativity values like hydrogen and chlorine, boron and fluorine, right? You have a larger electronegativity difference. This creates a dipole moment. And so that means you have a partial negative side and a partial positive side. The partial negative is going to go with the atom that is more electronegative because it's pulling the electrons toward it within the bond. Then we have ionic bonds. So remember that's between a metal and a nonmetal. Electrons are transferred, they're not shared. And that's due to a very, very, very large difference in electronegativity. Typically, if you're looking at the values, it's usually like 2.0 or 2.1 and above. That would result in an ionic bond. And then we have metallic bonds. Metallic bonds are those that exist only in metals. And that's when your valence electrons are delocalized. So that's when they're moving around the substance, they're not in one place. And this creates the sea of electrons. And that means that the electrons are not associated with any one atom. So then topic 2.6 looked at resonance and formal charge. And so resonance and formal charge go along with Lewis structures. So remember that you always want to create a Lewis structure. Remember our 6n plus 2 rule when we're looking at multiple bonds. But you always want to make sure that you're following the octet rule when you're drawing Lewis structures and that if you can form multiple bonds, you want to draw those in as well. But then we have what's called resonance. And so resonance just describes delocalized electrons within certain molecules where you can't represent the molecule right, or the ion as a single Lewis structure. So that's when you have more than one Lewis structure that's possible. And if you have more than one Lewis structure possible, you have to show all of them. And the way that we do that is using this double-headed arrow. So remember in class, we had talked about how you can draw that dotted line. AP does not want you to draw that dotted line. They want you to use double-headed arrow. So for example, ozone is O3. And when you're looking at O3, Right? Notice how you could have the double bond here, you could have the double bond on the other side. You have to show every possible Lewis structure. When you're looking at resonance and you draw the Lewis structures like this, sometimes there are multiple structures that you can draw. So if you are doing the 6n plus 2 rule and you find that you can have two double bonds or a single bond and a triple bond, Sometimes there is one structure that is better than the other. And the way that you tell which structure is the best is first, look at the, the structure and make sure that it's following the octet rule. If it's not even following the octet rule and it's not one of the exceptions, it's not going to be a valid structure. So carbon always wants four bonds. If they give you a Lewis structure that carbon only has three bonds and doesn't even have a lone pair on it, right, that it's, it doesn't satisfy the octet rule. So use the octet rule, but also use formal charge to determine which is the best diagram. So we'll look at how we can calculate formal charge. But remember that you want the structure where the formal charge on as many atoms as possible are zero. The structure might not be the same as the written formula. So the way the formula is written might not be the way the Lewis structure is drawn. So when you're looking at which structure is the best, you wanna choose the one with zero formal charges or formal charges with values as low as possible. So like plus one minus one would be better than plus two minus two. And then you wanna keep any negative formal charges on the most electronegative atoms, so oxygen or fluorine. There are, remember, exceptions to the Lewis structures. So sometimes you might have an odd number of electrons. Uh, remember that hydrogen only needs two electrons, boron only needs six. So you do have some exceptions when you're drawing Lewis structures. If we look at this example here, 
if the question says based on formal charges, so that tells you right there that you need to be calculating formal charge. Based on formal charges, which of the following is the best Lewis structure for H3NO? That is telling you in this problem based on formal charges. That tells us right away that when we're looking at these two structures to figure out which one is the best, we need to calculate formal charge. And remember the way to calculate formal charge is that you can draw a circle around every single atom, cut the bonds in half, and you can calculate formal charge that way. So you can draw a circle. So right now draw a circle around each atom, cutting the bonds in half. And then when we calculate formal charge, we want to do valence electrons minus the number of electrons in the circle. So if we look at this example, when I draw circles around every one, so if I'm looking at hydrogen, for example, hydrogen has one valence electron, there is one electron in the circle because you're cutting the bond in half. So one minus one is zero. So notice that each one of these hydrogens has a formal charge of zero. If we look at nitrogen here, nitrogen has five valence electrons. In this circle, I have one, two, three, four, five. Five minus five is zero. Then when I look at this oxygen, oxygen has six valence electrons. In the circle, there is one, two, three, four, five, six. Six minus six is zero. So this structure on the left all have formal charges of zero. Now let's just look on the right, let's just double check. So the hydrogens all still have a formal charge of zero, one valence electron, only one electron in the circle. If we look at nitrogen, so I circle nitrogen here. Nitrogen has five valence electrons. So remember, it's always valence electrons minus the number of electrons in the circle. Five valence electrons minus only four electrons in the circle. Five minus four is one. This nitrogen right now carries a plus one formal charge. Then if I look over here at the oxygen, so oxygen has six valence electrons. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons in the circle. Six minus seven is negative one. So notice how in this diagram on the right, nitrogen carries a plus one formal charge. Oxygen carries a negative one formal charge. The hydrogens are zero. This structure on the left is the best Lewis structure because all of the formal charges are zero. So when you have questions that say based on the octet rule and formal charge, that tells you check the octet rule, check formal charges the one in which all the formal charges are zero is the best structure. So I just wanna take uh, a second really quick to talk about how to make sure that you don't miss points on free response questions. This is from the write this, not that document, and this is specifically for unit two. So this first column is write this, not that, and then your rationale, so why? So make sure that you're writing ionic compound when you're discussing something that's ionic. Do not write molecule. Molecule is a covalent compound, ionic compound is ionic. Uh, make sure if you're talking about ions in an ionic compound that you're actually referencing ions and not atoms. Ionic substances are made of ions, so make sure that you're talking about ions and not atoms. Uh, make sure if you're talking about covalent substances, covalent compounds, um, when you're talking about molecules, right, those are atoms. Atoms make up molecules. When you want to talk about Columbic attractions, remember Coulomb's Law, you're looking at charges and distance between. Make sure that you're talking about Columbic attraction and not just opposites attract. All right, so make sure you're talking about, you can say, you know, Coulomb's Law discusses how, you know, um, a positive and negative charge will be attracted. You still want to make sure that you're talking about Coulomb's law. Make sure that your Lewis structures are complete. So they have lone pairs, they're showing resonance, um, because if you're missing lone pairs, you would not get the point for that. Um, show multiple bonds if you need them. Um, and then make sure that you are thinking about your shapes in uh, three-dimensional. So make sure that you're talking about, um, you know, trigonal bipyramidal. Make sure you're talking about what else you have bent. I mean, you have all those shapes. So make sure that you are talking about uh, the shapes, the hybridization, representing it three-dimensionally. Uh, so this is, again, part of the write this, not that document, uh, but you can refer back to this as needed.